Media in the Post-Truth Era, Rethinking Democracy and Security. Moderated by Mr. Brett Sadler. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this panel, the last, I believe, of this event. I spent uh, most of my broadcast professional career working for ITN, British Television, and CNN. And throughout that time, I used truth as the yardstick, the backbone of what I did and still what I do today. Yet 47 years ago, when I first out, started out as a junior reporter on a local newspaper in Greater London, uh, I was assigned to a section of the newspaper called Hatch, Match and Dispatch. For those of you who do not know what that means, it is births, marriages and deaths in the newspaper section. And I made some terrible mistakes on my first tryout. I actually buried a blushing bride and I gave birth, according to my newspaper column, to someone who had recently passed away. Now, this was genuine mistakes. I was very careless, I admit to that. Also at that time, I was told by a tabloid reporter, Brent, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Now, of course, that was a joke back then. Or was it? Today, though, it is absolutely no joke, as all of you will understand, and we understand sitting on this panel here today. We're in the middle of a communications crisis, and to discuss this further in the section called Media in the Post-Truth Era, Rethinking Democracy and Security, I'd like to introduce first our distinguished panel here. On my left, uh, Tinatin Tina Kidishelli, the former Defense Minister for Georgia, the first female Defense Minister of that country. She's a lawyer, jurist, and politician. Welcome, Tina. We also have on her left, Mitya Miodrag Vlahovic, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs for Montenegro, ex-ambassador to the United States. Welcome, sir. On his left, Robert Pstel, Public Diplomacy Division, NATO, uh, once upon a time uh, used to be in Moscow, uh, uh, at the f forefront of uh, speaking to the media there, and uh, not quite like uh, Sean Spicer, I'm sure, in Washington, uh, but he did face some pretty ferocious questioning during his years in Moscow. Uh, also, we have uh, um, uh, Greg Simons, the associate professor at the Uppsala Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies in Sweden, and on his left at the end, they're a long way away from me, but I can just about see you, Mike, Dr. Michael Carpenter, the Senior Director of the Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement in Pennsylvania. Mike is ex-Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. Responsibilities for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, and the Balkans. He was previously serving in the White House as a Special Advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. So as you can see, a very heavy-hitting, serious panel with us today. So, communications crisis. Mike, I'm going to start with you at the end, if I may. Are we in the beginning? the middle or somewhere else in this crisis today? Well, I think we're more towards the beginning than anywhere else. Uh, I think the proliferation of information on social media, the use of especially bots and trolls, um, as we look back at this period, we'll see that this is sort of the infancy of uh, journalistic relativism. and the inability of a lot of consumers of journalism to distinguish fact from fiction uh, and also choosing their sources of information and thereby influencing how they receive and process information. Um, I think that you know over the course of time we will probably develop both technical and also policy solutions to a lot of the challenges that we face with fake news with disinformation, propaganda, bots, trolls, all of this. Um, but of course, the other side will also, the propagandists will also improvise, will come up with new strategies. But you know, as I look at this, um, we are now sort of at the, at the very beginning of this discussion. And there's a lot of questions actually about how we go about addressing it with, with real solutions. Uh, and you've seen, you know, it have very serious political consequences in many countries, not least my own, where you had a foreign power uh, intervene in our electoral process, disseminate information that was hacked using a cyber attack at a critical point in time in order to skew the media narrative, shift the, new, the stories that were trending in the media at the time uh, with a clear political purpose, 
uh, and to my mind at least, with uh, a clear uh, end result. Um, and so, you know, this is just the beginning of, I think, what uh, is a lot more to be seen of, of this nature. Greg Simons, one of your roles is to teach young people media. This is one of your expert fields. How are young people who are born of this uh, social media revolution, which impacts very heavily on what we're talking about today, how are they reacting and how are you seeing those that will be responsible in the future for reporting and being involved with the news and communications? Well, uh, from my teaching, I can see that there is a certain trend uh, which is picking up. Uh, I teach a course uh, at Uppsala, Mass Media and Contemporary Armed Conflict. Uh, and so I go into all the different aspects, politics, journalism, uh, the armed conflict aspect. But one of the first things I ask them as a class, that it's very international, so there's people from Asia, uh, all over Europe, uh, uh, North America, uh, I ask them, uh, do you know what the fourth estate is? Explain to me what this is. And yeah, mostly they get it right, but they have an understanding what this concept is uh, and how it should be ideally uh, conceived and working. And then my next follow-up question, how many of you believe there is currently an effective fourth estate? If I get one or two students who put their hand up to indicate yes these days, uh, it's quite a lot. Um, m most of them do not believe uh, that there is an effective fourth estate. They understand that there is something deeply wrong uh, with journalism uh, in this current time, but unable to exactly point uh, what it is that is wrong. I mean, and after one of the courses, um, I had a Swedish student who, who came up to me and said, well, I was intending, he had this idealistic uh, outlook on life, and he said, well, I did intend to be a journalist, uh, when I, and this is why I took this course, and um, after what you taught me, I realised that, that it's impossible to hold my idealistic principles uh, given the situation, so uh, that, that he was seriously considering uh, another career uh, because of what he saw that, as this crisis uh, in journalism. And uh, I, this, this is also seen if you look at um, back, when was it, about five year, four or five years ago when the European Federation of uh, Journalists uh, started lobbying the idea of having the EU declare journalism as a public good uh, because uh, of the different economic uh, and political pressures on it. And this is not looking at the external ones, it's looking at, at the internal uh, things which were happening. So just as an introduction. Thanks Greg. Robert, you've been in the firing line of the media in Moscow in one of your roles. Um, what was it like to face the kind of questioning uh, that was uh, coming your way. And when you look at how the White House press today is handling the US media pool through the Sean Spicer uh, episodes, I will call them, uh, rather than press conferences, how do you relate to your experience and what you're seeing happening on screens today? Mm. Well, I would actually hope I would try to avoid uh, <laughs> the questions which relate to uh, the things ongoing in Washington. I'll write a little bit to Michael, but if I were to uh, talk about um, the experience, as you put it, I mean, that, that's quite telling in a way. I remember the presidential panel, we had George Washington, right? And here you have slightly, I don't know, deformed Pinocchio. Um, and there is a bit of that. One thing which one, I think, needs to remember is when one looks at the Russian uh, there's information, propaganda, machine. it's an industry. It's an industry, there's a lot of money involved. Yes, there are political instructions, obviously, and one should simply not look at it as a, as a, as a sort of uh, fully comparable. But, uh, so that's one thing uh, worth bearing in mind. But the fact that it is an industry actually creates paradoxically some opportunities because in terms of the news digestion of this in itself, well, there is a lot which, 
which has to be offered. I mean, very often in this uh, the situation is described that you know TV set has to win over the fridge because the situation when it comes to economy and other things. This was mentioned in previous panels is not as good, but. Uh, I think the most important thing, if I were to dare offer any suggestion, is it really starts, one has to start oneself, because if we define this, this information, fake news industry, etc., uh, as a kind of a virus, which I think it should be, to be honest, well, it, how do you deal with the virus? I mean, you have to stay healthy yourself. You have to believe in, in your principles. You have to be pretty sure, you have to check the facts even more. And if I may use this opportunity, uh, this is very serious business because, you know, in a place like Russia, you know, whenever you, you face the people who get paid for saying nasty things and, and peddling conspiracy theories, you name it, and basically pouring uh, buckets of, of, uh, of sort of um, <laughs> uh, intellectual manure over of the opponents, you know, you have to remember there are also people who've paid with their lives for fighting this disease, like, you know, Politkovska, like Litvinenko, he was not a journalist, but he died because he actually was trying to tell uh, as he saw the truth. So it is a serious business, but also I think that one has to approach it with confidence in, in the fact that, as I'm Polish, so in Polish we say lies have short legs. I think that proverb is actually quite popular in many languages, and that for me should be the starting point uh, of trying to develop the right strategies and actually of acting in terms of you know, stemming the flow of, of this uh, information virus. Let's go to Mitya Vlahovic now. From your perspective here in Montenegro yes. and the uh, NATO uh, session that you've now secured, give us some idea of the kind of torture that you, the defense minister was talking about at the reception last night during the period, the build-up you had to that session. Yes, thank you. So that was a very difficult period. Montenegro has actually gone through very different stages from uh, 1997 on because uh, this very historic period in, 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 the, in Montenegro, the benchmark is 1997 and some kind of distancing of, of Montenegrin political elite from the regime of Milosevic. So 1997 has led us to the neutrality of Montenegro during the NATO campaign and then consequently to the signing of Belgrade Agreement, which was a kind of internal uh, uh, interest. There is the, the move between the two significant moves that was some, some, some kind of tactical maneuver to avoid the direct clash or, or to lose the chance to actually regain independence. And there was, of course, afterwards the, the referendum on independence and everything which actually succeeded, including the campaign for NATO, which was under threat, uh, not only from, from Russia, but also uh, under the I would say uh, uh, certain situations which were present in, 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 in the countries of ex-Yugoslavia from the very start of the Yugoslav crisis. And if you allow me very briefly, because the, the fake information problem and the whole propaganda problem in, the, in this new, more diversified, more modern, more, more sophisticated way, my first personal experience with that was, was when I returned in 1991 from Poland from the postgraduate studies and there was already obvious, it was visible that there is going to be some kind of clash, a very uh, a tragic one in the territory of ex-Yugoslavia, and we organized here a Citizen Committee for Peace, which was kind of first peace movement in the history of this country, with a very naive idea that we could do something about that, that we could prevent the course of events which were already on the horizon. And to my astonishment, since I'm not an expert neither in that period, not now, for these kind of situations or, or, or this, uh, how to say, segment of our overall reality, we were very naive in, in believing that if we explain to people that this is not uh, 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 something which is going to produce a positive effect, which is going to keep Yugoslavia together, which is that there are crimes which are being committed already or going to be uh, actually uh, committed in the area of, of first uh, Croatia, initially in Slovenia, but afterwards Croatia and Bosnia. And, and, uh, and we were stunned with the fact that people were not listening. And even worse, they were not ready to listen. And even worse, they, were, they had an interest not to listen to concrete, uh, realistic, true news. They inclined to actually switch off the channel or change the channel when someone was trying to explain that Mr. Milosevic, one of us was saying that he is a future war criminal at the time. And of course, we were immediately labeled traitors or someone who is, of course, against the very essential interests of this, of this nation and this country. So that kind of pattern has, unfortunately enough, actually continued throughout these years. 
in different variations, in different forms, but with the same essence. And the problem is that we have different audiences. It's not one audience, fake news or, 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 or semi-fake news or the news which are in a, in a very tiny but decisive element, not true ones. Uh, they, they are actually addressing the people who are inclined to believe certain things and the people who are just disinterested to listen to certain truths. Uh, uh, since the United States recently is, has actually suffered the, 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 the more serious, according to all information, uh, this kind of uh, new Soviet, Russian propaganda uh, uh, means. You know, in America, you have basically two group of people, uh, groups of people. One is uh, people who would watch, for example, with due respect, and uh, my apology to that particular broadcast agency or, uh, or station, Fox News. And there are the people who would never ever switch on to, to, to watch Fox News. We have the similar, similar reality or situation in our countries here, not only in Montenegro. But to answer your question directly, uh, Montenegro uh, had a kind of positive pattern of resolving our social and economic and political issues and problems with a tiny majority in all these years. This is a still a divided country, but we had kind of a mixture of historic luck and the capacity of political elites and the knowledge of, of, of citizens as such and our nation as a whole to actually avoid the worst case scenarios and we actually made in continuation right correct decision in 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 uh, in, in proper time uh, nato in the context of nato that is where i end we were slightly late and i actually asked the question yesterday or the day before about that uh, uh, our russian friends probably has misinterpreted they have misread the readiness and, and willingness and decisiveness of political elite in Montenegro, political ruling political forces, to really make such a decision and to, 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 to finalize our road towards NATO. And consequently, I believe that maybe in a five years from now, 10 years from now, some younger people who are here or who were here in the last two days, they would probably write something in, in their thesis in some other uh, uh, intellectual or professional uh, 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 engagement. Uh, uh, what were the reasons why the Russian, uh, 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 Russians were so successful in, in the United States and not that successful in Montenegro? My kind of handy, this kind of ad hoc theory is that they have not understood entirely that we are truly serious about that. And of course, in the meantime, they have managed, you know, we were stunned to see, in, not in the last elections, but also before that, you know, the big posters, of, uh, incredible kind of messages saying that NATO is a criminal organization, torturing people, dismantling countries, ruining the future of, of nations. And uh, frankly speaking, the, 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 the bluntness, the, the, the directness, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the very rawness of, of these messages has actually helped us and our people to understand that maybe that kind of message is not entirely true one. Okay, thanks, Mitya. So let's turn to Georgia now. In terms of Russian interference uh, and in terms of your perspective from Georgia, what is your mindset towards what you're hearing today and what you're seeing unfold every day in terms of media in this post-truth era? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, the biggest problem uh, you asked in the beginning, uh, you asked Mike, uh, what stage we are, and uh, probably that's where I start. I think what we are seeing more and more, and I believe it's not only in Georgia, is we are in the stage of confusion. Uh, we are in the stage when uh, uh, the uh, lines between the truth and lie are blurred so much that uh, ordinary people do not really understand and do not really know anymore what to believe in and what not to believe in. Uh, and that's probably the best grounds for any propaganda machinery to get more active and to make sure that that confusion transforms into uh, more loyalty towards their news uh, sources rather than the others. Uh, this confusion um, is not new. Uh, I would not say uh, coming from Georgia probably makes it very specific case for me that um, yeah, the, the, uh, this whole fake news propaganda machinery is not news. It's a very old one. It was working very well during the Soviet Union. Uh, we all know famous cases uh, uh, of the entire world being confused about the uh, events happening there. But for particularly for Georgia, uh, we witnessed it uh, most vividly and most tragically probably in 2008, August war, uh, Georgia-Russia war, when uh, uh, the, uh, after the war, when there were numerous studies done by various international organizations 
uh, with the victims of the war, uh, especially from the Ossetian side asking uh, about the brutality, about the reasons for the level of brutality from their side. Most of them were citing this very one new story uh, that broke out on 7th of August saying that Georgians committed genocide uh, in the night, uh, killing uh, kids uh, in the basements of the buildings in Tchinwale. And uh, that very story affected so much and uh, the belief in the truth of the story was so high that uh, even after three, four years from the war, most of the people would cite that very particular news as the reason for the level of uh, brutality and level of uh, hatred that we all experienced at that time. Uh, so that's kind of the most recent or the biggest um, result uh, the, the biggest news story that brought results, fake news story that brought results to my country. Uh, starting from there, um, we are daily witnessing uh, various uh, injunctions uh, by Russian media, Russian politicians, the most recent one, two days ago, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has uh, made an announcement and there were numerous articles written about it that uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia historically never were part of Georgia. That's kind of a new narrative that they are now uh, using, uh, and that was uh, right after the two decisions that uh, internationally were made for the first time actually for all these years. One when the US, um, uh, the, the, the occupation ended up in a law uh, in the US and President Trump had signed it. Uh, uh, and then when the Council of Europe also for the first time declared this occupation in those territories as uh, uh, the ones being a red line for them to cooperate with anybody who would recognize it. So immediately next day, the whole propaganda machinery starting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs official statement started to work on it. But uh, here is one uh, sub point I want to make, which I think is very important. Whatever Mr. Lavrov or Russian media directly or already identified sources of propaganda like Sputnik or Russia Today are saying is not influencing that much the minds of the people uh, because they are kind of uh, transparent. We know uh, who they are, we know what purpose they serve, and it's pretty clear and very obvious that it's a propaganda machinery that is working, and it does not resonate that much with average Georgians. Um, but this, this is why uh, the, uh, the whole industry, and I completely agree with that, has got so complicated and so uh, multi-functional um, and diverse. When you get um, uh, across the board all kinds of statements, all kinds of news is spread by unidentified sources, and actually by the people who you would necessarily never believe serve the Russian purpose and Russian goal. But you, you're clo let me just interrupt. You're closer to it. You're more familiar with it than other countries, particularly in the West. How aware yeah. and how much more aware does the West of democratic societies need to be towards this uh, enlarging assault? On democracy in this uh, fake news post truth theory. Yeah, I think uh, that's exactly uh, that's the uh, that's a very good question, and that's exactly where the problem is. That uh, regardless of all the talk and popularity of the issue today in the conferences, you always have a panel about the fake news and propaganda. I don't believe that there is a, a real uh, in-depth understanding of what the reasons uh, are uh, for the popularity of the. Uh, fake media and for the uh, real um, attention to fake media by the ordinary people. I would say three uh, important uh, benchmarks there that make lots of difference and this is about the West as well. Uh, first of all, obviously, it's domestic. It's very easy, it's, uh, well, it's true, but also very easy to blame everything on Russia and to say that, well, this machinery is very active, they spend a lot of money, the industry is well developed, and they are using all the sources they can for having it uh, progressing and influencing the people. Um, and yes, Russia is there and there is no doubt about it. But second, I think the bigger problem is in our societies. And here I mean the uh, societies who still go under the transition. And probably Montenegro will be one of those as well, regardless of all the success and the achievements you have, especially with the NATO membership. Because if the value system is not strong enough, this is where Russian propaganda finds the fertile grounds. If you are still 
uh, not sure about what the democracy is all about, if you are not still sure about what the free speech is all about, what the whole uh, true media and the true facts are about, and how, if you do not know the techniques, how to identify truth from the false, if you are not sure about the very basic concepts of what uh, the sovereign independent state means, and if you are not strong enough on those concepts, then obviously history is a very good uh, and fertile grounds for the propaganda to work because you can always manipulate with the history and Balkans as well as Caucasus are famous for uh, very contradicting histories told by different nations living in those countries. And yes, Russia is uh, perfectly using that uh, to manipulate with the people. And the third, I think, very important uh, issue here is the statements and attitudes and rhetorics we hear from the world leaders, leaders of democracy. And here, I won't be very diplomatic and I can give you very, not that much war-related or conflict-related uh, example, but uh, Mr. President Trump's statement about the uh, so-called judge, for example, that we all heard in the news and uh, him saying this very sentence about so-called judge killed entirely 25 years work of the UN, uh, USAID, NDI, and all those American democracy uh, institutions in our countries uh, talking about independence of judiciary, teaching about independence of judiciary, and praising independence of judiciary. And we can go from there with the fake news um, the stories coming out of the White House and the most recent statements by the Secretary Tillerson at the Brookings about the uh, human rights not being that important. Uh, these are uh, the issues that are, uh, these are the statements, these are the, this is the background now used by Moscow in my country, and I believe it's not only in my country, justifying their cause. Saying that, uh, well, everything you believed in, you fought for, uh, you died for, you sacrificed uh, uh, the lives of uh, young generation in your country in those multiple wars, apparently proved not to be important because, well, look, it's not us, it's not Moscow. This is what Washington says today. And this is where I feel the biggest danger today. Not that necessarily and exclusively in Moscow, but much more in supporting rhetorics from other capitals. Uh, and obviously, French elections were if and if differently would have been one of those continuation of that trouble even more uh, that we are in today. So. Uh, I would say that domestic um, problems uh, that we failed on so many levels to have our uh, society one united um, understanding uh, what it is that we are building together for these 26 years as an independent and sovereign state, the Russian well-mobilized, well-paid propaganda machinery, and added today by the rhetorics supporting uh, those Russian principles and Russian totalitarian ideas uh, are the ones that uh, make our society so confused and so misled in uh, what they should be fighting. To okay, supporting for. the rhetorics as you just referred to there, um, that plays well at election time, as we all know. Um, so I, I obviously have to go to, to Mike Carpenter now at the end there and talk now about the media and Donald Trump. Um, is the media my old company among them, CNN. Are they feeding the Trump fake news phenomenon? To a certain extent, yes. I think part of what, you know, the phenomenon that we're seeing is partly a result of the cable news networks relying more on ratings and entertainment um, than on news. And I'll give you a classic example that involves your former company, CNN. CNN has now a proliferation of programs where, for example, if they want to discuss civil rights in the United States, they will have three panelists from respectable civil rights NGOs like the Southern Poverty Law Center and the NAACP, and then they'll have three right-wing crazy lunatics on the other side, and they'll have them argue uh, with each other. And while that makes for entertainment, and while they can spin and they can shout at each other, and it may, you know, it may be sort of fun to watch, um, it really devalues the discourse and it devalues the ability to apply critical thinking to important policy topics. And so you know, I think a few years back, 
and again, I, I agree that we shouldn't put all the blame on Russia because some of this is indigenous to our own countries. A couple of years back, you know, Breitbart really hit upon a novel idea. Hey, look, there is a segment of the population that you can target um, with stories that they will find persuasive and you can tailor your own narrative and the rhetoric that you use to spin essentially facts and propaganda to a particular segment market niche. And you know, it comes from analyzing how the ratings work for the large cable news networks. They see that, you know, CNN has a certain segment of the market, MSNBC, Fox News, as you mentioned, uh, to name a couple of uh, US major media news outlets. And, and so if you can segment, if you can find your little niche there, you can peddle all the fake news you want. And that's what, you know, Breitbart and other alt-right, uh, alternative, you know, right-wing uh, news outlets have been able to do. And they're, you know, they're taking uh, a page out of the Kremlin playbook, but these are, these are U.S. institutions that are perpetrating this, uh, this spread of, of fake news. But look, uh, one other thing I wanted to say, lying goes back to the, to the primordial times. We've always lied. We've always had propaganda. I mean, everybody knows about the protocols of the elders of Zion. But there is something about also the era of 24-7 cable news coverage, the breathless need to commentate on what happened two seconds ago as opposed to, you know, the next day. Um, and, and of course, Twitter and, and, you know, and all those other various forms of social media that I'm not familiar with because I'm a Neanderthal and a Luddite. But all of that kind of feeds this new phenomenon that we're seeing. And I think it's... You know, I think it's something that we really have to contend with, as I said earlier, from a technical perspective and from a policy perspective. When you were in the White House, though, what was your viewpoint inside the bubble at that time? And how do you think the Trump administration, from what you can see on the outside, is either using uh, fake news to his advantage or just simply doesn't understand the level and extent to which it is damaging, you know, um, open, balanced, informative, factual discourse at the top media levels of the United States? Well, frankly, when, when I was in the White House, I think all of us who worked with our strategic communications office were completely oblivious to the rise of Breitbart and to some of these other phenomenon occurring within the US media landscape. And I, I, I really think it took the, um, the people who served in the Obama administration by surprise to see this develop. Now, there, you know, in any, in any uh, public relations firm or any strategic communications office, there's a certain element of cynicism. And, you know, my, my friend and former colleague, Ben Rhodes, fed into this with a famous interview that he did that, that played rather poorly in the United States about how to spin certain stories for the media. So, you know, my point is everybody does a little bit of this, but we've now taken it to the extreme. And I think we were caught flat-footed by it. Um, in the Obama White House. Now, of course, I dealt with pol foreign policy at the time, national security. I was not, a, I was not in the strategic communications part wing of the White House. But nevertheless, I, I think they were taken very much by surprise. I mean, we talk about spin. What's happening today has gone way beyond spin. So yeah. I have to go now to, to Robert Stell and ask you, Robert, for example, when we saw in the White House, uh, in the midst of the uh, James Comey FBI dismissal, we saw Sergei Lavrov and the uh, ambassador in the White House. Uh, what sort of um, stagecraft was Trump, Donald Trump, trying to achieve on that day? And how does Vladimir Putin and the communications elite in that country, Russia, react to the way Trump is behaving in this communications crisis, if we're calling it that? Well, again, I, it's probably easy for me to, <laughs> to try to answer the second part of the question, uh, but I think I, I would approach it the following. I mean, I already described this, this, this information news uh, approach as kind of you know, a virus. Uh, the thing is this, that you, if you have a negative agenda, in a way you increase your policy options, right? I don't think it's even cynical observation, it's just factual. Uh, but I agree with Michael, there's always been an element of it's, it's a question of how high you want to keep your standards. I mean, I can speak for NATO. We work closely with the colleagues from the European Union. There's various things we simply cannot and will never do. We'll not answer propaganda with propaganda. It takes long to check the facts. We have to deal on, it's in the press service of NATO, uh, you know, uh, you know on, on daily basis, at least one or two 
disinformation stories. Even, you know, Secretary General gave an interview to Russian TV. And uh, the interview was broadcast. It was a Russia Adin channel. So it was broadcast in totality. However, it was fed into a, what's known as a sort of TV show, etc., where <laughs> the title you could see on the website is like, NATO preparing an aggression against Russia. Whereas, second gentleman record, you could hear it in an interview, that's something completely opposite. The point is that if you are prepared to do all those things, you, are, you, are, you may be sort of scoring some quote unquote tactical victories. But the opposite side of the coin is what does it do to your soft power? What does it do to your image? And here, I really genuinely believe that the long term, and this applies to whoever, whoever, if there are people in the US who would like to adopt this approach, uh, or there are certainly people in Russia and a few other countries for this, this is not a successful strategy. I was, you know, on the plane, I read Flight Magazine, and there was an article about Vienna, and it's actually about some alternative, not news, alternative architecture tools. And one building was described like Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, uh, Small, but sort of aggressive and megalomaniac in its, you know, this is about architecture. <laughs> now, I was struck by this. You could say, hey, that's good because it sort of, you know, builds the brand. But is that really the image you want to cultivate? But that's what you achieve. Take another example. Uh, Russian social media uh, from Montenegro responded with derision to all the stories that suddenly started being peddled about uh, Montenegrin uh, wine. I mean, I drank in. We do many people in this building. It's very good wine. I don't have any health effects. Uh, the same goes for you know the climate, etc. It just shows that there are certain limits. So the point I'm I'm trying essentially to make is that uh, be very, you know the people who want to engage in this, and of course there is a fertile ground because some of those processes, new habits, if you like, take place against the background of a very complex world. So conspiracy theories are very easy. I mean. Lots of young people in the audience, yeah, look, do check the facts, do sort of check the source information in the internet. It takes a bit of time, you know. But ultimately, uh, I would simply question the success of that policy because scoring those tactical points, whether it's like, hooray, we took some pictures which nobody else took, or we have managed to unnerve some people by, you know, presenting a totally sort of, you know, it's, it's just not the rest of it. And that is where I see, where I see uh, that the approach, which may be a bit more old-fashioned, which may not bring, quote-unquote, sexy sort of results, is in the long term the right one, because it is about the principles. And you're talking with your, obviously, NATO hat on, but I believe I heard you say, we NATO is not going to fight propaganda with propaganda. Now, propaganda is a conventional weapon, correct? Well, Can be used as a conventional weapon. So if, if Russia is uh, being accused of using propaganda as a weapon to undermine democracy, then what can NATO do to counter that? Well, first of all, we, we of course, we do spend time uh, responding. When I say we not respond with propaganda to propaganda, it doesn't mean we sit back on our hands and we don't talk back. We do. But we do it on our terms. First, it's the positive uh, agenda, positive narrative. We explain much, we try to explain in a variety of ways what we said. The EU does the same. We have also, I think, that's not just thanks to us or even the EU, it's, it's generally, I would give a lot of credit to you know, academic institutions, NGOs, even parts of the media, for improving the situation awareness. You know, there are people, I don't know, there are people, Valerie Hopkins and Tim Jordan and others, you know, read them, read the stuff produced by uh, the GLAP, the Atlantic Council. There is a lot of material, people who say, we don't know how these things work. I think they, they should you just do a little homework. But the other part of the story is that you know this does not happen in a vacuum. So yes, international institutions have to do a bit, governments have to do their bit, and some part of this it may be a long-term thing because it's we're talking essentially about education in terms of you know how people approach the information, what do they uh, do with this. Uh, we're talking even you know stuff which should happen at school level. And yes, media have a responsibility as well. But if you look at the populist level, which is where much of this fake news is obviously having a serious impact on, on democracies, uh, let me turn to, to Mitya here before I go back to academia and you down the end, Greg, because uh, I spend a lot of time, as you all know, in Serbia. Yes. And last year, 76%, I think it was, according to the Pew Research Center, um, agreed that uh, they wanted to stay away from NATO. 54%, uh, I think it was, uh, wanted to stick with Russia. So clearly NATO is not popular 
in Serbia. You were one of the last two rump nations of former Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro, before you went your own way. Yet you're so close to so close to each other. What is the reason behind you think that tremendous divergence in national opinion in Serbia towards what you have in Montenegro, albeit under the challenges you had in going along the NATO road? Hmm, that is a very good question, which actually I should refrain from providing the answer which I would give to you when I was younger. It's a very, actually, very uh, sensitive issue, and I would like to at least try to refrain from explicitly condemning certain political. That's not going to be politics. I understand it, Serbia. But the mindset. Of but people. long story short, you. I mean, okay. When I was younger, I would answer to you in a way that you. It was impossible to denazify Germany with Nazis still in power. And I think that in explanation, what is still going on in Serbia, one should actually also look at Bosnia and Herzegovina where, of course, the Dayton Treaty was a kind of measure to stop the war and to construct something which was probably envisaged or surely envisaged as a, as a temporary solution, which is now lasting. We actually, we were, last year, I, I met Mr. Pedias down in Sarajevo to celebrate the 20th anniversary of a deal which, obviously enough, has shown certain incapacities to resolve the peculiar situation there, and which has provided, by the way, the absolutization as I would call it in my English of the principle which is uh, in the very, uh, the very negation of the existence of the country because if you absolutize the ethnic denomination of the political players then the civic society and the old related issues including democracy in its essence and the free media as one of the expressions of democracy are at, at, at stake and in danger. In Serbia you never ever had still at least in, the, in, in, in this mainstream political forces, you never ever had a kind of enlightenment or some kind of critical uh, uh, understanding of the reasons and the realities and, and the facts and the, and the true which, what has happened in the wars uh, in ex Yugoslavia, in the last very tragical war. And uh, when you have such a kind of reluctance or, or lack of readiness or, or lack of willingness to, to address that principal issue, then there is this, this ongoing mantra that NATO was and still is an enemy, that NATO intervention is not actually an intervention in 1999, but it should be called an aggression. And it's not only in Serbia, you have a, a, a significant chunk of political spectrum in Montenegro where people are just reluctant or ignoring, still ignoring, to even consider, to even contemplate, or needlessly to, to, to publicly open a debate or to engage in debate what were the reasons for NATO to engage in Kosovo in 1999. So uh, it was not, uh, and, and when you try to, to explain to them that it was not that our friends in NATO didn't have to do anything, that they had a surplus of ammunition, mm -hmm. and they just decided, okay, let us bomb some Serbs in order to at least exercise or to train. No, there was 400,000 people for certain ethnic denomination were forced to leave, and a number of them were killed. And when you ask some political leaders in Montenegro, which are uh, colloquially called pro-Serbian ones, uh, do you know, Mr. So XYZ, what ethnic group has suffered the most in the terms of victims, of killed people during the NATO campaign? They are not ready to even to think that these are Albanians. You know. So consequently, if you have that kind of situation, it's not, it's an absurd, but it is also a kind of reality also in our country where uh, the, 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 the principle of Serbian Orthodox Church, which unfortunately and tragically enough still controls uh, a, a, a significant part of public and political life in our country, in Montenegro, when Mr. Radovic, that is the name, calls NATO, quote unquote, Fourth Reich, Reich number four, Nazi creation number four. That is absurd, but that is uh, beside uh, uh, tweets and, 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 and Facebook and internet and electronic media and printed media, you have this rudimental campaign which is still going on. And needless to say, Mr. Radovic and his assistants and, 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 and the, uh, the same role of Serbian church we have in, in Serbia as well, they are actually blocking the, 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 the very needed, historically needed opening of that society and addressing the issues which has actually put them in this kind of situation. So to end my answer, we have respect and understanding of our friends from Serbia, whatever the party or political affiliation or segment of NGO or civic society they come from, when they contemplate publicly and privately about neutrality of Serbia. But we know that is a fake kind of explanation or a, a euphemism or a hidden way to say that they don't want to address the issues which has led them to the situation where neutrality is a God-given solution for not actually addressing the very issue of that country. 
And that is not only whether they are Western-oriented or Eastern-oriented, because it's not that simple. It should not be that simple uh, on one side, but how they will keep their country, with or without Kosovo, in their minds, uh, uh, together with the ideas which are still present and dominating their political scene, irrespective of the fact that they have lost four wars in, 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 in 1990s in the territory of Yugoslavia. So uh, uh, we sympathize with all uh, in Serbia who are ready to address the issues which have actually led their country to this very situation, although uh, 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 the very fact that we have regained our independence and, and managed to come at the very doors of NATO actually uh, is also a, a product of our, and that is where I end, of the new element in Montenegrin politics where at least we have understood that Mont Montenegro is first to think and to deal with. I mean, Montenegrins throughout history, we had these crazy ambitious ideas to control and regulate and manipulate others much bigger than Montenegro itself. For the first time, our political, uh, the mainstream of political forces in Montenegro have understood back in 1997 and on that it's Montenegro first. And then, of course, if, if we can help the others, we could help them maybe in the most efficient way with a, with a good example. OK, OK, let me get back to the media again and the heart of this issue. And uh, let me go to, to Greg Simons, uh, who is based over in Sweden. Um, Robert Stell mentioned in his answer a few moments ago that it's up to the uh, readers, viewers, to perhaps fact check, go into fact check, spend some time checking what's true and what's false. Now, I don't think people, I think people have less and less inclination to spend the time to do that. And I know myself, and maybe you all do as well, you know, my appetite for bite-sized news gets larger, not smaller. You know, I want, I want it, it's like, news is becoming like fast food. You want it quickly and you want, you want to move on. Um, we were talking about this last night, Greg. Um, how do you push back against this? I don't believe, I think the time has passed when you can somehow reintroduce or go back to old values. Once upon a time when I used to report for CNN all over the world, I was not allowed to have an opinion. You know, everything I reported on is what I saw and was, was objective. Today, reporters do have opinions. I see reporters in the field having opinions from all networks. I see anchors, and it's not a verbal opinion, but it's a rolling of the eyes when someone makes a statement. Well, that is an opinion. So let me get back to you, Greg, with my question. What to do about this? You're in academia, you study it, you live with it every day, you teach it. What to do with this? How to, to bring more true information back to the fore again? Okay, good easy question. So uh, the, the first point would be to look at and understand uh, what is fake news and how it has uh, transformed. And the first thing is, if you look back 10, 15 years ago when people were defining fake news, what they defined it as is something that was fabricated. That was fake news. If you go back not so long ago, but before, uh, yeah, at this more current time, fake news became something which was deceptive, manipulative. Uh, so it's already gone from some, something fabricated to something a bit more sinister. But now I think fake news has moved on from that because fake news is something that does not fit with our world view. Uh, and you can see this in some of the um, discussions on the panel. Uh, it doesn't fit with your world view, it's fake news. I mean, Trump uses it, uh, it's used all around the world. It, don't agree with it, it's a condemnation. Um, so that becomes a little bit problematic because then you sort of have to ask uh, what is the role and purpose of news? Uh, and this is going back to the roots of journalism, at least from a more Western perspective, this fourth estate role. But as you say, I mean, it's not something you can go back to. Uh, but journalism has always had these pressures on it. If we look at the likes of uh, Edward Bernays, of course, who was talking about the engineering of consent. News was absolutely critical part to engineering consent in a democracy. Uh, so, and that is going back to the 1920s uh, in a democratic setting. Um, and looking at, at the, the results, um, Pew did an interesting poll this, this year. Uh, how many 
of the respondents uh, believed that the Russians hacked the DNC. It was about 70%. So that should generate outrage, right? Well, not in all instances, because this tr what actually uh, transpired is those uh, from the uh, more conservative part of the Republicans uh, actually held a more positive view of Russia and Putin after this. Uh, so they're, they actually, it's been increasing. Uh, and this is because this fragmentation uh, of these realities and so forth. I mean, it's gradually been, our sort of view of the world gets split into all these different partisan uh, ideas. I mean, I, th I think it was um, Kissinger who said that the last time that there was a, uh, a comprehensive and uh, unified view of a major historical event was the Treaty of Vienna in 1815. All sides, well, that, that's his, Kissinger's uh, answer to every yeah. question. But, uh. Uh, so, I mean, but what, what you're getting now is something which is completely different um, because you, you have these Republicans, uh, the, these cultural conservatives who, who do not see Russia as an enemy but more as an ally in terms of their particular world view when it comes to traditional values uh, and so forth. Uh, you also have those uh, on other different parts of the spectrum who see R Russia as being beneficial in other terms. For example, uh, confronting uh, the US global hegemony as they see it. So you've got this, these different fragmentations now. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you sort of plug this? There was interesting, I just mentioned before, um, that this is something which is being discussed. And one of the points was that there was Dutton, who, who just a few days ago uh, published something on uh, bubbles and echo chambers, uh, and social media in particular. And social media, I mean, it's part of the problem, but also a part of the solution. I mean, it's where it's being disseminated. Uh, but one of his points is that the ones who are most vulnerable uh, to being manipulated by information are those who are not politically engaged, uh, because they were, are more likely to consume less sources of news. They just look at something uh, and don't look elsewhere. Those who are more politically engaged will start, as you say, fact-checking. They, they start looking up alternative sources. I mean, what a journalist should do, this confirmation, this looking uh, to see if there is consistency, if there is truth, veracity uh, to it. But even, the, the uh, Greg, the process of fact-checking itself mm. gets more confusing mm -hmm. as there are more sources Yep. More fake sites. Look at the Wikipedia. As a journalist, we can never use Wikipedia as a source uh, to report uh, uh, on air. So, yep. you know, the fact checking isn't so easy either now. No, but I mean, it's, it's an issue all around because looking at news, uh, this is not about uh, informing objectively people so that they can make a a reasonable decision based on the best facts available. Uh, looking at news today, news is becoming more of something to lobby, to uh, direct uh, people into one direction or another uh, by that uh, organisation that is doing the communicating. And uh, an additional problem to that, I think, is confusing journalist sources and those that are not journalistic in nature because there are some news sources that is not journalism. Uh, the public diplomacy, they've got another function other than uh, news uh, in the strict uh, sense of informing objectively about a certain uh, issue. I think that's really important what you just said then. So I'm going to throw it to Mike down the end there. Uh, Mike, Greg just said that journalism is turning into a kind of lobbying operation. Do you agree with that? Well, you know, I'm not 
I'm not sure if that's the case across the board. Um, I think that it is being manipulated by a variety of actors. Uh, there are journalists who certainly try to lobby, and you look, you know, I won't name any, any names in the United States, but there are clearly certain news outlets that have a certain slant. Uh, but then there's also the political manipulation of what's going on. I mean, you look at what, you have the President of the United States who accuses certain news outlets of being enemies of the people. This is language that is coming from Stalin. I mean, it's just outrageous. And then you have, you know, the White House itself that, you know, that disputes, you know, trivial issues, from trivial issues like the size of a crowd that appears at an inauguration, but clearly spins it and lies about it, to more serious issues like claiming falsely for example, that the Obama administration had approved a raid in Yemen when in fact that had not been approved. It was approved by Trump himself together with his Secretary of Defense. And so <clears throat> I don't think it's so much that journalism is lobbying. Certainly there are sources within the media sphere that, that try to portray a certain slant on information as I said earlier. But it's just the corrosion of the entire system by political forces. That's that's really what I see going on. And you know, and I, as I said earlier, Russia is to blame, sure. But I'm talking about the president of the United States. So what's the pushback? What's the pushback within the I, world of you know, diplomacy, my, your world, or the world of journalism? My own. My my feeling is that you have to have some sort of independent ombudsman-like organization that is composed of respected media outlets that will call out lies when it sees them, uh, fake news, and that will also um, take to task journalistic or media outlets that use sources that they haven't fact-checked. A lot of this that's happening also is laziness on the part of journalists. They will cite a story because it appears on their uh, on their computer screen, and they, like you said, Wikipedia, uh, or not necessarily Wikipedia, but another news outlet, and they won't go back to the source and double check. Triple it's self-propagating, isn't it? It's self-propagating, so there has to be some sort of ombudsman-like role for a, a credible one, and it shouldn't probably be government run, it should probably be independent, run by media organizations themselves, that will fact check and will call people out. You have that in the United Kingdom, uh, Press Complaints Commission, uh, but not a very effective body, I have to say, nor is its successor. Um, but if we look at social media now, let's obviously spend a bit of time talking about that. Facebook, um, and, and any, any of you feel free to pick this up, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, refuses to acknowledge that Facebook is a, a publisher. Uh, he calls it a, a tech company. Um, uh, you think that's the right way to go? You think it should be... Uh, seen or operate as a tech company or as a publisher? If I may, uh, not being an expert on these issues, I would dare to say that there is no a, a, a stable, durable cure for the problem we are talking about, first. Second, it's fake news is, is a very bad phenomenon. A tailored news, a, a something, an interpretation or political statement uh, uh, presented as an information is even worse. And that is what we have a problem with. It's not only the, the, the very, uh, how to say, uh, a true test or a true track whether something e has happened and what was the true story behind the information we were faced with. It is actually why certain things are interpreted in a way they are interpreted and of course with the dissemination and, and, and absolutely diversification of, of media and the means of communication towards the audience or different audiences, the problem has actually has become incurable to my modest understanding. Ombudsman is a very nice idea and not a new one if I may. And there is a different variations of that very uh, a, a body in different countries. But as you have just said, even in Britain, which is a long lasting for the time being democracy, there is now an efficient element or element of efficiency in, in that particular kind of resolving the problem. Uh, for years to come, we are going to be faced with a the, with the battle in between propaganda presented at journalism and journalism, which is trying to remain journalism. Yeah, and also the problem with journalism, and I'll come to you next, Tina, the problem with journalism is um, the history of journalism and its use of journalism by intelligence services to gain secrets from countries through the journalistic cover, of course, has, has had an impact on how journalism is perceived, particularly in non-democratic countries. I have lost count of the times when I, as a British reporter, working for an American TV network, would meet uh, top officials in Saddam Hussein's regime, 
or the Iranians or some other regimes, and I would be told quite simply, Brent, we know you are a CIA operative, we know you're a spy, but let's understand we know you're a spy. I said, listen, if I was a spy, which I'm not, I'd be working for the British SIS, because I'm British, not American. And they would look at me with complete horror, because they wouldn't understand what I just said. Oh, you're British. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mentioned that just, as a, just to break it up a little bit and bring some humor on what I think is a, a, a deadly serious subject. So let me switch now to Tina. How much damage to liberal democracies is this uh, fake news, this post-truth uh, era having on us all? <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question in a second just to, to answer your previous question about the Facebook and Twitter. Um, I don't know how much publishers they are or what, what's the name for them, but uh, I think that what we are talking about today is not that much about the journalists being the major or only source of spreading fake news or fighting fake, fake news, but it's everybody. Uh, we get news about President Trump more from Twitter than from the traditional media, and he is journalist himself in a way because he is the one who spreads information. What do you think of his use of Twitter before, <laughs> during, and after the election? <laughs> uh, well. First of all, well, I'm a politician, so I, uh, it's a great thing that you are ready to communicate so openly and be so open to, to the public. But at the same time, I, um, uh, there is an understanding that uh, you've used this word before uh, about the meeting with Lavrov staging. What, what is the staging you propose to, the, uh, to your followers and, or those who are uh, watching the Twitter on a regular basis? Because well, again, uh, from our personal experience, there was a picture posted by President Trump on his Twitter a uh, week ago when he met with Prime Minister of Georgia that brought unbelievable attention in Georgia. I would never imagine that, I, I didn't even know that so many Georgians were uh, had Twitter accounts and were actually seeing it. President Trump sitting and Prime Minister uh, of Georgia standing um, and it was not the best picture you would wish from your strategic partner uh, on Twitter posted personally by the president or whomever posts on his side but on the president uh, Trump's Twitter. And next day we saw those pictures, smiling faces and uh, uh, making jokes uh, pictures with the uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Lavrov. Uh, yeah, that was kind of a staging that did not really serve the purpose while the meeting was really great and the outcomes of the meetings were really great for Georgia, but just that one picture killed it all in a way. So it was not in any media, it was not in any newspaper or any TV screens, it was just President Trump's tweet account that posted that very picture. Yes, it is a news agency in a way because that's from where you get most of your information these days. I don't know. Uh, that many people around me personally who watch uh, TV as much as they get the information from Twitter or Facebook or other internet sources and uh, social media. So I would hesitate concentrating this kind of a discussion on journalists ever anymore because most of the time the source of those fake news or the true news, doesn't matter, are not journalists necessarily and journalists are using those sources that are not necessarily coming from journalistic websites or from the journalistic sources themselves. So we are all in a way part of this whole big game of journalism today and this is why I think the, uh, this is where the problem is. How to deal with it is obviously a the most difficult question today, but I would say that uh, eventually, uh, well, first of all, truth prevails, but also our actions, decisions, uh, the, the uh, very concrete uh, activities of international organizations like NATO or European Union or uh, leaders of the democratic world uh, talk for themselves. And here is the answer to your question that uh, uh, the erosion of liberal democracy, the making fun of liberal democracy uh, as we see today from the leaders of the democratic world and uh, uh, making fun of and erosion of those uh, values and beliefs that uh, the uh, modern civilization stood on are uh, probably the best source for, the, uh, for all, any propaganda machinery. And uh, uh, why we for example, Georgians or Ukrainians or Montenegrins or any of those countries who used to be part of 
Soviet Union itself or bigger socialist bloc? Why we do not want to have anything to do with Russia today and why we are trying to escape this circle? It's not because we do not like President Putin's appearance or we don't like his, uh, uh, how he talks or what he says, but it is because we uh, are trying to escape from this illiberal totalitarian system of governance and we are trying to, to, to move to free world. And uh, uh, there is the problem uh, today that that free world talks to us almost the same language as President Putin was using over the years. And we are puzzled and people are confused and you, don't have, you are not that strong anymore. Fighting fake news with propaganda is wrong. And I think that that will serve Moscow's interest the most if we start now spreading lies about things like they do. But at the same time, uh, unfortunately, there is less and less left for us um, uh, to have a, uh, positive news campaigns because, yes, except for Montenegro's accession to NATO, there is no big news today uh, that proves that uh, the uh, international organizations or European Union are resistant to Russia's pressure and uh, uh, they do, uh, they, they make their decisions and they act according to, the, to their own interests and interests of those states and activities and the results of those states rather than whatever Russia wants to see uh, in its own neighborhood or in its own uh, area of interest. Robert, you go along with all that? Well, in, in general, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the bad news is like that, I think that came out clearly in all the and to mention today is that you know it, the problem is not going to go away. We cannot disinvent the things we not particularly like, particularly people are like it. It's there, you know, social media and you know various things. I mean, mentioned fact checking, which I, I think is very very important to support that. But the bad news is that even fake fact checking, you know, portals. So that's the bad news. Uh, and the complicated bit of news is that. It, it's a complex problem and requires complex solutions. But the good news is that if everybody, every actor, if you like, on that scene does their bit, the things which can be done, economic uh, aspects, we haven't talked about it. In Georgia, your country, one of the problems we have kind of noticed <laughs> is that a lot of very interesting independent websites, which were created you know, for the purpose of, of really you know, sharing information, have been sort of gobbled up by rather unknown entities and started, you know, uh, sort of publishing rather different things. Well, it's clear that there is an economic aspect that should be looked at. The question of legislation, well, in some cases, it's about the standards. I mean, the media, all the evolution, have been subjected to various standards over the years. I think, in general, as long, of course, as the balance is struck. And I think we can do that. So there's a role for the government, even for the parliament, if you like, the education part. But then everybody should look, you know, at, at areas where is it that they can bring something? I already mentioned, you know, uh, one sort of fact-checking a day would help. You know, uh, there's various myths. I mean, it's an industry, you know, so it's going to produce a lot of them. But, you know, uh, one, one, one another issue which, uh, my, it's, if you, we have to stay, I come back to the first point I've made today, we have to stay kind of optimistic. People, I'm not going to quote another famous US statesman, you know, you cannot fool all the people all of the time. Give an example, it's probably the most famous Russian propagandist, Mr. Kisilo. And in the last, uh, the week before his, his Sunday program, he seemed to have some scratches on his face. And the people noticed, and there was a lot of speculation where they come from. Well, he came up with, well, judge for himself, whether you find it very convincing, uh, he apparently was planting olive trees in his dacha in Crimea, and he fell into the gravel, right? Well, he thought this, this really close. It, it was met with a lot of religion, whereas on a serious point, the, the face of Alexander Navalny after an operation where he was, you know, right, was, went viral. You, and it's just, you don't have to really understand anything more than just rather bantery speculation about what happened to Mr. Kisilyov and rather serious speculation what happened to Mr. Navalny. So, and we're talking about a, 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 an information space which is pretty heavily regulated. And Mr. Putin last week was a 28 page, have a look, it's on Kremlin's website, order for a variety of agencies uh, in Russia, state agencies, to come up with the base ways to essentially control the internet. So, sort of going in a Chinese way. So, but, but the optimistic part is that even in Russia today, this is not 
uh, accepted at face value. And the statistics for the last two years, where we certainly had to deal with the most, I'd say, aggressive and, and you know, uh, no principles involved, for instance, anti-Ukraine campaign and promotion of Crimea hours, all the rest of it, shows a very significant drop in the number of people in Russia who want to watch, who do watch television news. Uh, so that is, you know, it's a new generation. So in other words, again, I don't want to belabor it, there's no time, but I would, once again, strongly appeal, we have the instruments, we have the arguments, we have the facts, you know. Why is it that people in this region, maybe not in Montenegro, somehow believe uh, that, opinion polls show that, that the majority investment here is, is, comes from Russia? That is absolutely not true. You know, it primarily comes from, if I may say so, NATO countries, who are EU countries, also have been in United States, Canada, others. This is, these are the facts. We don't have to belabor the point, but we, we have the arguments, we have a vision, we have, we have the, the proposal, which are much more interesting. It's just, I guess, we have to be a bit more active, a bit more creative, and we have to spend a bit more time thinking about this. And at the end of the day, I'll finish on this. We all, each individually, have a choice. You wake up in the morning, do you really have to read Sputnik, even if it's your no local language? Read something else. <laughs> you know, generally, or read a good book. You'll be better off, and everybody else will be up. So we all have a choice. So, <laughs> good point, thanks. So, Mike, let me come back to you again on that one. Um, Donald Trump's base, uh, you think they listen to anything else other than the Donald? Do you think that they uh, look at the Sean Spicer press conferences at the White House and look upon that as a reality show that reinforces his support? Uh, how do you get to that Trump base as, as a Democrat, as someone who has a diametrically opposed political view uh, to what Donald Trump is currently displaying? Yeah, that's a really tough question, um, and one that you know we've been grappling with inside the Democratic Party. How do we reach out to this electorate that is clearly within its own bubble and that processes information in a different way? Not only that gets its information from different sources, that may not actually be the case. Um, they see a lot of the same information but they process it differently. And I've, so I, I've looked into this a little bit and I've seen you know, there's focus groups with Trump supporters and so on and, uh, and so forth. And you know, a lot of them acknowledge that some of the statements, like for example, the statements about the size of the crowd uh, on the National Mall during the inauguration, they acknowledge that, that Trump was exaggerating and that it was false and that in fact the crowd was larger uh, during the Obama administration, but they don't care um, part of the Trump appeal is that he portrayed himself, and this is another interesting aspect because, of course, he portrayed himself as an outsider who was going to challenge the establishment, uh, a, a, you know, a New York tycoon who's been associated with uh, the establishment for years and, you know, a multimillionaire. Um, but they, they don't care about the lies. They care about the message that he's going to shake up Washington and drain the swamp. So if you're going to appeal to these people, you have to find you can speak to them and you can message, but you have to, it's not gonna be messaging about, um, about the size of the crowd or about this or that particular uh, piece of information that's coming from the White House. It's gonna be messaging based on other things. It's gonna be messaging based on corruption within the administration, the Russia angle. It's gonna be exposing some things that will shed new light on how they perceive uh, Mr. Trump as opposed to challenging particular facts that they may not, as uh, citizens, care about at all. They may recognize that they're lies, and they don't care. We were talking last night um, about uh, Trump's uh, suggestion or um, implication that he might stop the, uh, the White House daily press briefings. Um, what about the media just not attending them anymore? We know about the gaggles and Sean Spicer that excluded companies like CNN. Um, what about the media being responsible for trying to, to, to shut down, or shut down, to control, to control, to control what's happening? Or does that run contrary to what the media is supposed to be doing? No, I'm actually, confused. I, I think that would be highly effective. If the media did not show, if the mainstream media abdicated attendance at White House press briefings, that would send a tremendous signal. Now, there would still be a lot of coverage, and it would seep out 
And I'm not sure that you could get a consensus among the media to, to all uh, abstain. Sure be someone who would try and backfill and, and show up so that they could you know, have it on the scoop. Um, but I think it would have a tremendous symbolic impact. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. But. Let's, let's go to the floor now. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? If you do have a question, please say uh, who you are uh, and who you're representing, if not yourself, and please direct it at one of our panelists, please. Um, if there are no questions, oh, yes, please, sir, over there. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Serian Girgi. I come from Kosovo. Uh, we've been acquainted all these three days. Um, a little bit of a reference to you, Mr. Sandler, about Wikipedia. I recently read about the Serbian history there that they came first century in the Balkans. And if you try to change that, they would send tons of emails to the Wikipedia confirming that that's true. Uh, which is not because the old history encyclopedia says they moved from the seventh century onwards towards Balkans, uh, which is not so. It's a good fact not to reference um, to the panelists. Uh, former Minister of Defense, Ambassador Lauvich, uh, to the NATO diplom diploma diplomacy. Division, Mr. Pessel, is that right? No, Pessel, Pessel. Okay. <laughs> I have one question: How you fight fake news? Because so far you all talked about fake news, fake news, and we know exactly what you mean. But how you fight it? And uh, uh, for Professor Simmons, what are you going? What are you doing differently? that you're showing to your students that this way is how you fight and you get to the right sources of information. Last but not least, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, personally, I believe President Trump is the strongest leader in the world right now because of one thing. We, we listen and read all the media, including CNN, that he's going to lose the elections and he won the elections. <laughs> Now I read on the media that he's going to not finish his mandate. This is a very serious question. What happens to the political and geopolitical situation in US and outside US if he really does not reach the end of the mandate? And what would be the conflict inside the state, United States? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mitya, if you um, pick up first, we'll take them in the order of the question. Uh, I wanted to say time? to yeah. Bern, maybe sorry. you work for MI6? I'm sorry? Maybe you work for, for MI6. MI6. Maybe, you, M maybe you work for MI6? No, I never CIA. worked for this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mitya, please. Conspiracy theories are the easiest ways to explain the complexities of this world. A fake one, of course, but you know. I'm not an expert on Kosovo uh, questions. Although I identified myself this morning in order to, uh, to, to try to block the avalanche, although I was from Kosovo, <coughs> so I'm uh, aware that, uh, that it's kind of difficult sometimes. Uh, l let me use the opportunity, since I, uh, uh, our Kosovo friend was very active these days, and I do appreciate that. I, I, I was among the people who actually were looking forward to meet our dear friend Enver Hojai, the foreign minister of Kosovo these days here. And if I may, my, my absolute private capacity to be an ambassador in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, I, I'm disappointed personally that um, Enver is not uh, here. I have understood that there was a slight problem with the asterisk in the, in the, in the, in the footnote in the invitation and, and, the, and the papers of this conference. But uh, uh, let me remind you, uh, including our dear friends from Kosovo, and I hope that they will have the possibility to communicate among uh, each other when we return. Um, Montenegro has played a, a, a very significant role uh, in, in, in the process of, of calming down the, 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 the contrast and friction and the, and, and the escalation and the crisis itself in the context of the recognition of Kosovo as an independent country. 
And we did that uh, back in 2009 with, if you believe, only 15, 1-5% of popular support. So that it actually took a great deal of, of political vision and courage and readiness to deal with very unpleasant and, and tricky situations on the side of our leadership at the time. And from mom that moment on, uh, 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 we are faced with the situation that significant political forces, our friends in Kosovo, are not ready to finalize two processes which are of utmost importance for the, not only for the bilateral relations, but for the regional stability as such. One is the recognition, which is not only a formality, which also has a psychological or socio-psychological and political and strategic relevance, and that is the recognition uh, of Montenegrin ethnic minority in Kosovo, constitutional recognition, which is still kind of a very fluid idea, which is nowhere near the finalization, first. And second, the, the famous demarcation, demarcation uh, the famous definition of the, of the frontier, of the border in between two countries. There were, if I'm not mistaken, three or four international, uh, very professional and neutral, objective commissions which were dealing with the establishment of that border. And everyone is aware that <coughs> the results were always the same, and even our American friends incentivized, and the European friends have incentivized our Kosovo neighbors to finalize the process. And uh, unfortunately enough, now the, 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 the new elections are called, and, 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 and the parliament itself didn't have time to, to, to finalize the process. So, uh, 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 we need a better understanding of the necessities of the nations and countries in the region since a number of negative processes are still not over. Uh, one of them, maybe not the most important one, is the Kosovar-Montenegrin relations or Montenegrin-Kosovar relationship as such. But uh, uh, still we are, and, and, and that is why the fake news and the propaganda and, and the new diversified and, and sophisticated way of dealing on and projecting uh, uh, fake realities and fake information are still so uh, uh, efficient because of the primary reason which is actually feeding the prejudice which exists among us in Western Balkans. What to do about it? First, I would like Enver was here and uh, he to respond now to my, to my very friendly and benevolent intervention. Uh, what to do about that is, uh, I think that, uh, as I said, we are, and, and I do support our dear friend from Georgia, in, in the context of we are responsible primarily for our internal situations. If we are not ready to, to, to manage, to control, and to, to provide the basis for the positive development of our own, in our own countries, then it, our intention, whether it's formal, public, uh, uh, hidden, or visible towards the others in our neighborhood is just uh, 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 less credible. If you are not performing back at, in your home, then your attitude towards the others, however benevolent and positive in, ex is, uh, in its expression, is just not credible enough or not serious or not understood seriously enough. So uh, 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 we are all together, but we are also on our own, where I do agree with you. Uh, 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 the problem of the, of the Southeastern Europe, as Colinda would say, or, or Western Balkans, is that we have a number of unfinished stories where political elites in different countries, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Albania, or Montenegro as such, are still trying to find shortcuts for the situations which require, as Karl Popper would, 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 would say a long time ago, a step-by-step -step social slash political engineering. So we need patient, but very persistent kind of uh, political activity, which could lead us towards the lasting and stable solution, instead of propaganda individual, internally in the countries which we have mentioned, and regional one, where we are repeating certain mantra without any concrete, concrete result. So in Bosnia, if you ask me very briefly, if I may, in Bosnia, if they are serious, if, 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 if Banja Luka is, is really not trying on, on uh, supported by certain circles from Serbia and Russia as well. Uh, of course, uh, not trying to harm the country as such. They should finalize this process uh, uh, concerning the, the military property. If they don't, uh, the whole story about uh, membership action plan and, and further steps towards NATO are just uh, impossible to finalize. Serbia and Kosovo, both political elites, they have the, all the reasons to perform in the context of harmonizing their relationship, whatever the solution. Unfortunately enough, we can see both in Belgrade and Pristina, we have people who are in favor of shortcuts. And shortcut, inverted commerce in this context, could mean the swap of territories. Northern Kosovo for Serbian part of Bosnia, southern Serbia, 
and of course division of Macedonia at the end. Uh, ending with Skopje, with Macedonia. Our dear friends there should be, I, I have tried to ask this morning the, the, the presidents who are present here about, it. of course, it was a rhetoric question, but nevertheless, there was no answer because I believe not only in, in Zagreb, Ljubljana, or Podgorica, there are no uh, uh, ready made answers for the situation in Sarajevo or Skopje, but what I'm frightened with, literally, neither Brussels nor Washington have an answer in this very moment. Beside that one which Mr. Hoyt has actually presented in Skopje a week ago that the thing should be calmed down and they, sh they should behave. On the other side, and that is the bottom line, uh, Moscow appears to have, I mean, oh, uh, it seems to be the case that Moscow has an answer. What is the answer we have seen maybe for the time being in Georgia and in Ukraine, but uh, I'm seeing tomorrow morning, very early in the morning in some of the uh, Western Balkan countries, we could see this kind of recipe coming from Kremlin. Okay, you went a little bit off subject, but you came back to it at the end. Um, Robert, do you have some kind of wrap-up statement to come I mean, now? Your last one was watch different news organizations. Yeah, I mean, what, there was a question actually. Uh, what, yeah. I, I'll try to, I mean, very concretely what we do, but illustrate if you like. First of all, you have to talk back, you have to set the record straight. We have actually a portal called Setting the Record Straight, which deals with the biggest myths, if you like. We the point is that here you cannot deal with every bit of, you know, every conspiracy theory, every nonsense, because you just don't have the time. And plus, it, we have to set the agenda. We cannot be sort of put total on offensive. We, we believe we have the answer. So setting the record straight, there is, uh, there is mainly in, in, in view of the myths, uh, persistent myths which come from Russia, but some of them you recognize, for instance, this one famous myth, Crimea. Uh, annexation and see it's the same as you know sort of Kosovo of course it's not and we explain why second uh, thing is more general terms we we do believe in media we try to be as transparent as possible everybody can come and report we have lots of journalists who are credited for lots of events including for instance upcoming summit we have we do press those and so on. third point of course we go with the times we try to be more attractive in our answers the same thing you know, which you can put in the text. We have economic graphics. We have a NATO TV channel. Okay, it's not going to rival CNN or BBC, but it's the sort of thing which particularly young people find a bit more attractive, and we do a lot of it. Social media, that's not that easy because, you know, institutions are notoriously um, badly equipped to sort of, you know, to, <laughs> to, to have a debate. You can post something, but then you want to engage. But we still try to do it, and sometimes we cross swords with various people uh, as we have to do. Next thing is dealing with the civil society. Again, I would like to pay tribute, since we are in Montenegro, of the role the civil society, the NGOs, have played in actually explaining NATO. You would not have the level of support this because there's been a market rate, if it wasn't for there for those people. Some I could name with pleasure. But one example, which I'm very proud of, what we did together, is we have invited the opponents of NATO to NATO HQ more than a year ago. This was not a pleasant vision, I have to say. I started speaking to the group, and after five minutes, the guy stood up with a T-shirt, which, let's put it in mind, it was rather insulting towards NATO, some member states, but okay, you win a few, but we had a debate. There were people, for the first time, as I understand, visiting NATO from the Montenegrins and the Orthodox Church, which is something. And the last point is simply... Serbian. Serbian, Serbian yes, that's right. Not Serbian. Exactly, Serbian. And the last point is simply being ready to engage, to have a debate. You know, we are proud to be... a partner of this event for a number of years. Is it because we come here and say NATO is the best thing, sliced bread, etc. We may hear various things we do occasionally which we may not disagree with, but that's not the point. The quality of the debate here, I mean, it's, it's all about, I mean, it's, this is what it's about. It's about discussing serious issues in a, in a serious way. It may not bring immediate results, but it's again something we can do. So anyway, I could go on, but I repeat the point. We should be more. We should believe much more that we can uh, change and, and sort of stem the tide. But it will not happen because of one event, because of one intervention, one you know. Do, do you have a Twitter section at NATO? Uh, various many of us do tweet, starting with the Secretary General and others. And you know, uh, I think you know, judging by the response, uh, we have some. Uh, you know, there is a recognition that at least we act in this field. But I would lie if I would say that this is perhaps, you know, the area in which we can, because we are, after all, an organization representing 28 countries. So when we speak on behalf of 28 countries, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing. But on the other hand, there is a lot of tweets 
uh, Twitter accounts who are held by people in allied countries. So in that sense, you know, yeah. we, we have to be there, but you know, let's not pretend I'm that the subject matter of international security is an easy issue sure. that you can sort of, you know. Sure, but, but I think we're in a good area. And I'll just flip it over to your colleague on your left there, Greg, in a second. But you know, the, the Twitter phenomenon, it is a new source in itself. It generates news, it generates follow-ups, and it enlarges in the social media space. Um, and it, the Twitter bites that come out from Trump, as short as they are, they make huge news stories and they last through the news cycles over 24 hours. So should institutions like NATO representing those countries, like the, uh, the Democrats, that uh, the organization that Mike's setting up now, uh, the Joe Biden Center, should these institutions get with the game of being able to get their message out, bite-sized, popular, easy to understand, and that people will react to and will make news itself that people will read. Because I, I, see, I see institutions still not moving in this populist field, but they somehow have to get the message into. You know, you can't just have a parallel institutional response to what's happening in the media. You also have to get to those people that you're not reaching. So, uh, from the academia side, Greg, how do you handle that? The, the question which was posed. Um, Take them both. Okay. Well, first of all, the, the question which you asked in the audience. Uh, the, the first point is that I get students uh, to think critically about all information which they come across, regardless of the source, uh, and to uh, engage in it uh, to pull it apart, to, to dissect it, uh, and to look at what is the purpose. So it's going into rhetorics. It's, uh, is it trying to pull your emotions? Is it trying to make a, a, logic, a reasoned logic? Uh, what, what kind of effect is it going to have? And I do this with concrete uh, examples, and I get them to look at a multitude of different media sources on the one event uh, as an illustration of that. And now this, um, how you're getting these uh, social media are feeding um, mainstream media content. Uh, well, that's been something which has been going on for a while and you, you've got a lot of sources um, uh, and people are, are going off the deep end, not really doing the due diligence in journalism. I'll give you an example. It's an interesting one. Uh, in Latvia, there is a social uh, media network uh, called Friends. Uh, uh, and on this one, you had a, a public relations firm <coughs> that, that was uh, trying to uh, boost the uh, I think I think it was Tele2, a mobile phone company, which is a Swedish one, that, that they wanted to boost its uh, awareness in the market. And so what they did, uh, they went and did a video uh, of a hole dug in the ground in the Latvian countryside. And they said, look, uh, a meteor ha has struck uh, the Latvian countryside. And... Uh, <coughs> nothing but a, a kind of semi-amateur video of it. And they put it on this little tiny uh, n uh, social media network. Well, within uh, a few hours, this was appearing in mainstream Latvian newspapers and uh, media without question that it was true. Uh, then they started consulting all kinds of um, uh, scientists around Europe and uh, talking about this thing. Within 48 hours, this news was featuring in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, at the end of it, uh, they said, well, ta -ta, uh, this was a public relations gimmick. And of course, the journalists were absolutely dissatisfied. Uh, but it, it sort of illustrates this problem uh, about uh, verifying and facts and things uh, which are going through, especially if it's very short bite-sized stuff. I mean, the same uh, to be said for uh, content which is not derived directly from journalists, and here I'm talking about uh, public relations content, uh, especially. Uh, there have been in some instances where 
in the UK and Australia where some of the main newspapers have uh, their news content is anywhere between 60 to 80 percent uh, derived from public relations sources and quite a lot of it without any added uh, critique or comment by the journalist. So it's quite a, a slippery slope and um, yeah, it's, it's a matter, well, you can't turn back the clock, but how do you get off this track? Mike, down the end there, please. You have uh, one question from the floor to take, please. Well, I actually wanted to, uh, to go back to the earlier question about how do you fight propaganda. And I, so I agree with Robert. I'll be very brief. And your Latvian meteor story has kind of blown a little bit my response out of the water. But what I was going because what I was going to say is that we should look to the Baltic states because I think but but this aside, I do think the Baltic states have have done a good job of educating the populations. They have been a little bit inoculated by the virus of Russian propaganda. And so when they see it, they understand it. The mainstream media are very quick at debunking. So when these false stories about the enhanced NATO forward battalions and soldiers raping local pop, uh, uh, members of the local population came out, the mainstream media seized on it very quickly, punched back. So I think that, you know, in, in the US, we're just sort of uh, deer in the headlights, kind of blinded by what's going on. I think we will get to the point where we are also a little bit more inoculated. But the other piece to this, which we haven't talked about, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but really, is, you know, I'm sorry, but stupidity breeds propaganda. And the failure of liberal education, and this is something that someone like Big Brzezinski has talked a lot about, when you know whatever percentage of the American population, 80% can't locate Iraq on a map of the world, or they don't know that Moscow is the capital of Russia, are we surprised that you know 67% of Republican voters think that we should have an accommodation with Russia? Well, they don't, you know, come on. So it's also, there's a deeper institutional educational uh, dynamic to this. Um, but to not disappoint Georgie, your, to answer your question, um, we need a credible independent investigation into links between the Trump campaign and Russia. If it concludes that there were links, and if uh, Mr. Trump leaves office before his term is up, it will cause immense short-term uh, disruption to our foreign policy, but in the end, it will be the best thing for the institutions of American democracy uh, if you look over the long run. I'll take one more question from the floor as we're almost out of time and lunch is calling. Just one question, please, Jans. to one panelist. Jans. One panelist. No sneaking in five questions to five <laughs> panelists. Just one. Just a very simple question, actually. I mean, clearly the most insidious form of fake news is not sort of globalized village gossip or conspiracy theories, but it has political objectives. Do you think it's useful to distinguish between what I would call state-sponsored disinformation, state-sponsored fake news, we've seen this with Russia, but potentially with other powers, and guerrilla fake news, guerrilla disinformation. <clears throat> In other words, insurgent activities by hackers, fake news outlets that don't necessarily have state connections. I mean, do you think it's useful to, to look at this if we're talking about the politics of it? Tina. Um, well, I think uh, if it's fake, it's fake. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter what's the origin of it. And mostly, I'm pretty convinced that uh, even those guerrilla uh, activities are tied up to the state-sponsored activities, either directly or unintentionally. Or intentionally. Um, I think that we, uh, we need to have a one unified response to, to the entire propaganda machinery and this industry that is out there and is gaining strength. Um, because in, as, as we were saying here before, um, you don't get that much, if it is Mr. Lavrov or Mr. Or President Putin talking, you don't get that much of uh, uh, trouble from it because it's transparent, you know what they mean, you know why they do it. But when it comes from so-called independent sources, then you get confused. So I think that it's all the same. Uh, as long as it's fake, we need to fight it, and we need to have one unified approach how to defeat it and how to have the truth out. Any follow-up question? May, may I just on this? Sure. I mean, it is a very interesting question, but my, my answer would be a bit 
bit more nuanced. I would say yes and no. Uh, I mean, in, in the sense that we, we, we have to treat the problem regardless of the source. It's like NATO's cyber defense policy. It, it doesn't matter where the attack might come from. It could be crime syndicate, a state, or terrorist organization. We have to have the capability to defend against it. But of course, then the, 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 the problem is that these days we see some cases where you can talk about some sort of hybrid. <laughs> you know, I think that you might have an element of, you know, rogue, whatever, somebody doing this for whatever reasons, political, even a joke, etc. But then you have some states who might get involved. And, you know. But the other aspect is simply the consequences. So you have to defend the truth and deal with the fake story. But then if it's proven that it comes from a, let's say, state, organization, it's part of the foreign policy, then of course the, the political fallout uh, would be different. So that's, you know. Uh, yeah. So it starts with exactly name and shame or whatever. Okay, time time is running out, so I'm going to close the session, but not before asking uh, yeah. one final question. And I insist, please, ladies and gentlemen, on one sentence answer. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the question is: Post truth, as we probably all know, was defined by the Oxford Dictionary last year for the first time. The word of the year: post truth. How long is the post truth era? going to go on for vis-a-vis -vis the media and what we're seeing today. How long? Mike? Not terribly long. I think in the end uh, we will find uh, a way to separate the wheat from the chaff. There will always be stories that are propaganda or disinformation. But I think, as I said in the, at the very beginning, I think we're in the in the infancy of this phenomenon, I think we will find ways to deal with it. Uh, I think it will, certainly the information landscape will be more cluttered, there will be more chatter, uh, but I think we're gonna actually get through this and we'll find a way to navigate in a way that publics can actually get real sources of information and know what is true and what is false. Relatively optimistic. Let's go to you, Greg. Yeah, well, pretty much in line with what he, he said. I mean, first of all, you, you get a, a, th a particular risk or threat, and gradually, uh, it shouldn't take too long, as you say, that evolves a countermeasure uh, to this. And then comes the new threat uh, or the risk later on as a response to that uh, oh. accommodation. Okay, Robert? Uh, remember Fukuyama's famous end of history? How long did that last? <laughs> Well, once people realize that history still goes on. So, I mean, for me, truth exists. I just don't like this label. I think it's misleading. So it's more like it's, it's, it's about not this situation. It's about how, uh, you know, how uh, attached uh, people will be to, to this label, which I think is misleading. So I, I hope short, <laughs> because the truth exists. Mitya? I don't know to answer your question, frankly. But I would answer Janusz's rhetoric question with no. I believe that state sponsored, organized, or initiated fake news slash propaganda slash hybrid uh, uh, war, etc., etc., is something which is becoming increasingly, increasingly dangerous for all of us. You know, the time has passed when TAS, Telegraphic Agency of Soviet Union, was authorized to announce TAS, Yaulash, and the Sovsti. We now have a very indirect two, three, four, five indirect sources, which are actually at the end uh, or the beginning of the rope uh, related to a task under new name. And we, are, the, the things are too complicated and I don't believe that the uh, guerrilla uh, media outlet is equally dangerous uh, with the state sponsored one if that very guerrilla is only actually a fake state or, uh, or a covered, a hidden state uh, controlled media because if you uh, at the end of the day you know frankly speaking we have mentioned that unfortunate uh, uh, event if you try to oppose if you individualize and try to oppose fake uh, uh, news and state media you could end up uh, eating some plutonium for your breakfast which is not uh, pleasant I think. Tina how long? Um, post, I, post truth I, with us. Yeah I think it's as long as, as TAS was mentioned as long as we allow for TAS uh, reporters to be present at uh, President uh, Trump's and uh, Mr. Lavrov's meetings. Uh, as long as we don't allow for that, uh, that will be a clear message and the start of the end of that story. But, but to answer even more specifically, I do believe that uh, it takes just one big move 
that will make all the difference. And that one big move might be the uh, investigation in Washington, um, in France, or any other big campaigns where Russia is involved. And uh, I believe that if that's credible, when once it's out there and the results are there, that will be the end of it. And at story. the end of the day, it goes to leadership. It goes Absolutely. to global world leadership. So I'm going to close there. Thank you very much indeed. Distinguished panelists, it's been a pleasure to be with you today, and I'm sure we appreciated uh, everything we've heard from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.